Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, we have um, Superintendent Godfrey Saunders here to talk about the upcoming school bond. Uh, we want to give you a chance to take a look at what they're proposing and be able to have the opportunity to ask some questions. So, Godfrey, I will let you go. Thanks, Christy. And thanks for coming today. Um, this is for us, and I know for you, it's, it's pretty important. It's one of the goals that we have uh, set for ourselves is to make sure that we communicate this as best we can to our stakeholders, and that's why we're here. And then we've made some improvements to this. We've been able to answer some questions that we didn't ask ourselves before that we didn't know. So your input is very important to us. It's critical for us. Because one of the things we want to do is get it right and do it right the first time. And we want to make sure that there's no misinformation out there uh, as with regard to what we're trying to do, what we're asking for. Um, and so I, 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 uh, I encourage you, even after this presentation, if there are folks out there that have questions, please have them contact us as so that we can we can address those the questions that they might have. Um, the election itself, bonds will be sent out on the 8th of February. The, the bond itself will be sent out on the 8th of February, and the last day to vote will be February 26th. So it will start on the 8th, and February 26th is the last day that you'll be able to vote on it. So why are we doing this? We're doing it basically for three reasons. And there's some, uh, some subheadings or some things that go under those three reasons, but one of them is equity, number two is capacity, and three is flexibility. Under equity, there are several, three things that we, we, we're looking at. One is safety. The kids uh, having to cross that street at Heck Claw uh, across Broadway, how many times do you think they cross the street during the day? So, any guess? Take a guess. 20. 20? Yeah. It's, it's a good guess. It's 65 times. Oh my God. The kids are going back and forth across their day. 65 times a day. Now, and just, there's a slide that talks about that, that puts it in context, but just the number of times in a year's time, that's 11,700 times a year, that's a recipe for disaster. Of all the things out there, this is the one that frightens me the most, that concerns me the most. All of it's important, but this one we can't bring back if someone goes down. Loss of construction time, there's a slide, we'll talk about that as well. If you look at this portion of it, those kids in the hall, this is that same, that's the same hallway on the right. But this is that hallway filled with kids. And you talk about the equity issue, you go to Saddle Peak and you go to Ridgeview, those kids don't have to, I, th I thought this was a dungeon. I came up and I said, what's a dungeon used for when I first got here? And people said, well, that's where our kids change and they go up for, for health enhancement or for BE uh, to other classes. If, under the best circumstances, you're looking at probably five minutes to do that. That's loss of instruction time. If you have every class in that, taking five minutes to do that, it's an incredible amount of time if you, if you add it all together over the course of a year. Next slide. So it's six to five times per day. That's not a controlled intersection, not a controlled area where they cross that. The only control I have has to do with the crossing guard there. And it is, Every week, we have some incidents involving cross guard, crossing guards and uh, vehicles. We even have vehicles come up and they bump the crossing guards behind their knees. Don't hit them, they just bump them. Honking their horns is a standard affair, but they bump them on their knees. Um, and it, and, but beyond that, it's distracted driving. Uh, and I know that they're looking at reducing this, the speed limit until to about 15. But 15 miles an hour getting hit by a vehicle is still, it hurts pretty bad. And if you got a kid out there, I, I hate to think of it. <clears throat> this is the slide that I was talking about earlier. 65 times per day, 325 minutes of education time lost every day. 325 times per week at five minutes of education time, at 1,625 minutes of education time lost every week, and over the year, that's 58,500 minutes of education time lost every year by the Equa students going across that collectively, of course, not one plan, but collectively, all together. 
And I have the principals at Head Koala here, Lord Dinghart, uh, back at Chase from Saddle Peak, and then Matt Johnson from uh, Ridgeview. And they can tell you, uh, Pat and, and Matt can talk a little bit about how this differs at their school, things that they don't have to deal with, their kids don't have to deal with, and why. So I, I invited them here today just for that, because they can tell their story much better than I. So Matt, if you want to talk a little bit about that loss of instructor time and safety, it would be great. Um, so I'm Matt Johnson, I'm the principal at Ridgeview. Uh, actually, we're working on instructional minutes now for next year's calendar, and that 58,500 minutes is almost equivalent to one grade level for an entire year. Um, fourth grade needs 64,800 minutes of instruction in a year. That's almost a full year for one grade level that's lost because of that transition time. And when we talk equity uh, of educational opportunity in the buildings, my school doesn't have this issue. Um, when students are in Lori's school and they need to go from the HEC building to the Quad building to the PE, kindergartners, it takes them longer than five minutes to put their stuff on, especially in weather like this when it's cold, they want to get their winter coats on, snow boots on, go across the street. I mean, you're talking 20 minutes easy for kindergartners at least. Uh, for my school, we're all inside, we don't have any streets to cross, they just run out in the locker or out in the hallway, slip their gym shoes on and they're off. It takes them two minutes to get down to the gym. Um, safety reasons, we don't have street crossings. We do have people bumping into our crossing guards. It seems to be a <coughs> systemic issue across everywhere. Um, but just in terms of what students at Ridgeview can get over what students at HECO are getting, they're in the classroom a lot more. And that's that's a lot more teacher contact time with students that leads to higher, ideally higher achievement. And so that's that's a big problem. Matt, yeah. yeah, similar setup, Saddle Peak. Um, we even have less distance to travel with our stacked floors in the school. Our students aren't at any time, they're no more than about 50 yards apart from, <coughs> excuse me, any one of the classroom doors they need to get into the library, the gym. All that stuff is right there, very accessible. Um, and I just, for me, I can't imagine what goes through Lori's head every day on the security side of things. Of trying to maintain two buildings and keep two different buildings secure where you have two staffs separated basically. Um, that's that's a big one for me on top of the instructional minutes that are lost is the safety issues and not just the crossing of the street but how you manage two separate buildings on one campus with only one person running back and forth in between the two. Um, yeah, our students again very quick class to class. We don't have to change for anything. Um, we have our own set of issues that we'll talk about later, but um, it is, it does make a big difference. Uh, we're able to transition kids from one class to another in less than three minutes. Uh, to be able to get out of the classroom down to the gym and get going. So it's, it is a big loss of having to go back and forth that many times. Uh, I've been in other campuses where we've had separate buildings as well. And same thing there. It's a huge chunk of time out of the day that you're missing just to get to where you need to go. Um, it's not something we have to deal with in either of the other two schools. Back one, back one, Jim. I'm sorry. <coughs> Okay. <clears throat> Educational spaces are not consistent with Saddle Peak and Ridgeview. Um, this one right here is the ADA circulation. Um, Americans with Disabilities Act and whatever you want to call it, but the windows in Qua are open 24-7. <coughs> They're open 24-7 because when Hat Qua were built, they were built, there were no codes really. Not modern codes didn't exist back then, but there's no mechanism for circulating air in that building. None whatsoever, especially cloth. So they leave the windows open 24 7. Not only is it an economic waste, it is also a health issue. It could be a health issue. And we've had air quality studies done on head quad, uh, quad, and the thing that came up was the carbon dioxide, 1,000 parts per million. That's a ceiling. That's a ceiling for the EPA uh, safe level 
for uh, parts per million of carbon dioxide in the air. <coughs> but the recommended level is 600 parts per million or less. I'll let Lori talk a little bit about what she, her experience, she's the principal there, so. Yeah, <coughs> Um, I'm Lori Dayton, I'm the principal of Um The other ADA issue is that we're not handicapped accessible. We don't have elevators or lifts, and so we often, in the quad building, that occurs along quad building, when we have special things going on in classrooms or a child, let's say, we've had this a couple of times, has broken a leg and has to get to the top floor of quad. Um, using crutches to go all the way up and down, or we've had teachers with knee replacements, or grandparents or parents who have mobility needs or issues who can't get to those classrooms, and so we have to figure out where we're going to meet so we can have some of those conversations with, um, let alone then making it to a special class event. Um, and so uh, that's been really difficult uh, when we have the custodians in the summer and they're moving desks or tables or whatever it might be, they don't have an elevator to use. And that um, makes things difficult. It works when it's comp goes up because people get injured more easily. Um, we've talked about this before. HECWA has the highest work in comp claims. I still think that's true, probably. Um, and, you know, um, just having the two buildings and the two buildings then the equity, the staff doesn't feel as connected um, just by they're a long ways away. If you go from the gym to the end of the kindergarten hallway, that's like two blocks. Perhaps I know the middle school is awfully big too, but if you want to have some collaboration with some different staff, with the PE teacher, the kindergarten staff, that's a long ways to go to collaborate. They're great buildings. And people say, what are you going to do with them? They're not going to mothball those buildings because they, you know, they are good buildings. But as far as the purpose of educational purposes for a modern 450, 500 student girls by elementary, they have served their purpose well, but they have outgrown that purpose at this point. They have outgrown it. But it's so, there's still some use there. There's some things that have to be done to those buildings to make them um, educationally sound, to be used as an educational facility, to make them sound enough for that purpose. So, and, but that's a part of this bond as well. Next one. Right now, where we are, we're expecting 400. <coughs> Additional elementary students over the next 10 years. 400 over the next 10 years. This is, and I asked Ted Barkley, the city manager, how many new homes are currently planted for go grade? He said that aren't there now, he's at 2,000. I also asked him how many acres are under possible, um, people are thinking about developing, how much acreage? He says anywhere from, I don't know, 150, 200, 300 acres. And I said, well, how many acres? How many homes can you place on 200 acres? This is roughly 2,000. So it's, it's, it's coming. It's just a matter of when and, and how long. Where we are right now without the bottom, this, is, this blue line is our capacity to handle the growth. That blue line is our capacity to handle the growth. Now you go all the way up to 28 to 2029. 20, you know, I, like I've said before, you know, by the time you get here, I'll be fertilizer by now. <laughs> so, but some of you are young enough that you won't be fertilized. You won't be, they won't be able to use it for uh, keeping the sod healthy. But me, but here, we want to make sure that this blue line goes up. So this is where we are right now. Nothing changed. This is where we're going to be all the way out. And we, those kids, they're going to come at some point. It may go down and they go and up and down, but they're coming. Belgrade is the fastest growing district, the fastest growing community in the county at this point. It is overtaken by yes, yes, just to illustrate that point. I'm John Black, and by the way, I'm the HR director for the uh, school district. Um, I joined the school district just seven months ago. I bought a new home out in the Henson subdivision. I was the first person out there. And I drove through my neighborhood just the other day to see how many families have moved in now because all the building that's going up in there. There's 12 families that have currently moved into the two blocks that are right around my house. <clears throat> there's seven new houses that just went up and are now on the market, and there's two new holes right now. So the, and they're building all weekend, Saturday and Sunday, they're building constantly to get those things in close so they can start on the inside. So it's it's been mind-blowing to watch it 
just in the seven months I've been here in, in that in that neighborhood of Henson. And that doesn't include Ryan Glenn and some of the other subdivisions that I've gone on. Thanks, Sean. Now, with the bomb, this is where our blue line goes. With the bomb, this is where it goes. Now, you'll see that if we do pass the bomb, there's still a little bit of red right here, right? And that's over capacity. But what will happen is, when we, for the bond itself, uh, what, we're, what we're attempting to do, like buy property, uh, two pieces of property, one to build a replacement for Equa, another piece of, which is 18.9 acres, another piece of property, which is 40 acres, is going to be south of the freeway, so that we can have room to put a school, or a couple of schools over there, to accommodate growth on that side. So south of the freeway, 40 acres, and to build uh, elementary number four, and a future middle school, so a future elementary number four and a future middle school. But also in this bond, we have some funds in there to repurpose Het Qua, the old Het Qua. So one, it gives us the flexibility. Remember, I said there are three purposes: three, one was capacity, and the other one was flexibility. This will give us the flexibility right here to handle this. If Het Qua was, was built to code, Het itself were, were, were brought up to code it would be able to handle 200 elementary students. To take care of this, should we get to that point, or when we got to that point, it could handle that, because we could do the things that, needed to, that need to be done, and they won't have to cross the road. They will not have to cross the road. Are you with me? They won't have to cross the road, but it can do that. The things that need to be done in that far are numerous. To numerous. We talked about the, the circulation issues. Heck has the same issue. We would also, uh, to bring it up to, to, to code, where it could handle more technology. Right now, the, we can't put more technology in the building. Even though we have to take our tests and stuff online now from the state, technology, instructional technology, people, teachers are using technology for instruction purposes. To, uh, we can't do all that at heck right now at Quad because it just, we can't, they don't have the electrical capacity to do it. We got a quote, what would it take to bring both those buildings up the code and make them a functional uh, 500 elementary to handle 450, 500 students. To remodel that and bring it up the code, in, for, for that a number of students, it would be $10 million, is what we were told. We won't get away from the issue, though, of having to cross the road. People talk about, well, why not build a tunnel? Ted Barker said you would have water issues if you build a tunnel. Going across the road, a walking bridge. He says, if you got three dump trucks loaded with funds, you can probably with money, you can probably do that. But it's going to be costly. And it won't do it with the issue of moving kids across that road. So this will give us the flexibility once we repurpose that quad, this or heck, to do that, to take care of that. And if you have property, as a district, you don't want to sell it. People say, well, why don't you sell that quad? Well, there's another thing that we know from research is this. When you have, a, when you have a property and you keep it, like in Belgrade, when, when the growth occurs, right now you have all these subdivisions going in. But at some point, the folks within the community who are my age are going to be moving on or going to be the school, going to schools in the sky somewhere. They're going to be moving on. And then who's going to, who's going to move back in? Younger people. And those younger people have families. That that gives us more flexibility to deal with things. So that's a value of property you never want to sell, in my opinion. You want to keep it. I just and besides, there's a sentimental value there, and there's a historical value there to the community. Uh, that's a part of who that's a part of who we are. You don't want to get rid of that. So we're going to keep it. Next. <clears throat> the flexibility portion. Right now, there's things that we would like to do for community education, especially with adults, that we cannot do. We would, offer, we would like to offer opportunities for the senior center to use a building for overflow from the district, because that's important to us. It's important to them if they ever have that. We don't have that space right now, but we would have that during the day for them if we had. There are things that we can do that we can't do, uh, but if we had this flexibility, it would, it would be good. Remember that little red overgrow, that little spark, that little spot there? Flexibility for continued growth. It will allow us to handle that. 
you talk about administrative offices, for the most part in our office, there are four individuals in one space, um, not, not even close to being this large. It's not efficient for doing your job. It's okay if you're just going to sit there and do this all day. But if you're having a conversation with a, with a patron, with a stakeholder, and another person's having a conversation over there, and you're trying to concentrate on doing something, it gets to be pretty, pretty rough on those folks sometimes. Um, for me personally, you can put me in a box and I'll be fine. I'm okay with that. And that's the same with the house. Uh, that's why I, I don't have nothing to do with our house. My wife does the house things. I don't care. Just give me a box. <laughs> I'm good to go. But uh, sometimes, do you want the box painted? No, I don't care if it's painted or not. This is a decent box and a finished body. So, um, with their boardroom, our boardroom is way too small. It's way too small. We're going to get a double A district, and it's going to continue to grow. The boardroom that we have now is comfortable for about 20 people to come in and sit comfortably. If that, it needs to be larger. So this will give us that opportunity. Also special education. We have to ship some of our kids to Bozeman because we don't have the space to, to implement some of the programs that we need to. We can't serve our own kids because of that. Our special needs kids. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so I talked a little bit about what? Two new elementary schools. One to replace that co-op, and one school in a property to accommodate growth for a third elementary school. We also want, this is now your future middle school site, remember that, that 40 acres, middle school number two, and Sabbathy had co-op modifications. Now, what modifications do we need to do to Sabbathy? I'll let Patrick talk to him, talk, address that, he's here. It would, and uh, that's his school, and I'll let him talk about South Peak and the modifications there. Why do we need those? He can better do that than I can explain it better than I can. Um, yeah, this is the second district I've lucked into the newest building in the district, and uh, schools learn something every time they build schools. And the biggest thing that has happened with South Peak is uh, we love the school, everybody loves being there, we love the community put that in. It's a huge resource for us. Uh, but the commons ended up being much smaller than what it should be for a building that size with that number of kids, uh, which is our cafeteria where the kids eat, uh, really affects their lunch. You can go to a Ridgeview, you can even look at the Qua building, and their cafeteria is much larger than what we're dealing with. Uh, what that does for us, how it impacts us, is it really stretches lunch out. We have to spend a longer period of time during the day serving students in a lunchroom, which again impacts instruction. Um, and in fact, staffing and creates a need for more staffing because we have to obviously ban that for a longer period of time, uh, which we know costs dollars as well. Um, but the main thing is we just can't get uh, kids in there during that time to eat to be able to function the way a school should function, um, getting in and out pretty quickly. Our lunch period is longer than the other two buildings. Uh, it's just a real tight space. And then, uh, for instance, when our parent teacher group tries to host events in there, yeah, it can become cramped for those things as well. They're just not a great space uh, for it for mainly getting kids lunch in a timely fashion, but uh, it impacts a lot of students there as well. How when is your, your lunch period goes from one to what? Uh, we start just after 11, about 11 10 is when kindergarten starts coming down and we go to 1 15. So it's a full two hour lunch period. <coughs> yes, kids, kids are either eating too early or too late. Which means we're snacking during class a lot as well because the kids that come in late have snack in the morning and the kids that come in early have snack in the afternoon too. Thank you. Hey, can I ask a quick question? Yes. So have you um, had any complaints about pick up and drop off there at Saddle Peak? Oh yeah. Have you guys, <laughs> I mean, have, have, is that an issue that you've even looked at to try to change something with that? Yeah, I am not in this on necessarily, but um, something we definitely have to address as well. Uh, the Saddle Peak was built on the property that the district had available at the time, and with that came a lot of space constraints, hence the two stories, which uh, you'd be hard-pressed to find a modern school building anymore that's built more than one level high. Um, playground's a little too small, there's a lot of things that just got crimped and crammed in <coughs> what space was available, so I do kudos to the district for using what was available at that time to make the best out of what they could, but yeah, the parking. I just hear a lot of parents say they parked down the street 
and these kids walk down there. Yeah. The yeah, good luck trying to, if you're coming up Jackrabbit from the north coming to the school, uh, good luck trying to turn left into the parking lot in the morning. Takes a long time. Yeah. Huh. And with well, the, it just seems very compact. And with all of those housing developments that are going in out there that we just talked about, Jackrabbit in front of the school is just going to get worse and worse. Yeah. It, it's, to me, that would be a big issue. Yeah. Um, one of the things that Godfrey and I kind of talked about a little bit, it's the problem is it's a city street and a city park, and how you deal with that is right behind the playground is that South Circle Loop, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. um, there's that city park right there. That there are already a lot of parents that will pull in there and drop their kid off because they can just keep going around and out. Um, and then it's right next to our playground, so we can move it that way. It's, uh, I think that's one of the things that the district would be wise for the district to address <coughs> some, to have someone do a little traffic study of what how can we alleviate that park within that parking lot. But like Patrick said, you know, you, there's some there's space constraints there, and um, unfortunately, <coughs> um, they had to settle for uh, what they had. There was a deal in the works um, with the developer to allow to, to give the district a parcel of land, a parcel of land for free to put that school. On. And then something happened, and that didn't, um, it fell through. And they were in a time constraint, so they said, well, well let's build on the property we already have. And that's where that came to play. But a great question. Great question. One of the things I would, I don't know if it's even feasible, but it would be like a parking pull through loop off of Jackrabbit. There's quite a bit of space between Jackrabbit and the school if there was a loop that would be built through there eventually, might need some of that. Excellent. Excellent. Overall cost. On site development cost. Remember now, this, this chart is for all $48 million at once. This represents all, if we're going to issue bonds, every penny of that bond right away. But we are not going to do that. We're going to issue it in phases or stages. Initially, it will be about $28 million that we will issue bonds for. Not the whole 48, only the 28 million. And that 28 million will be uh, to build this, 16 million, 925 dollars to build a new uh, headquarter. And like half of this will go for on-site development, parking, play feet, playgrounds, and so forth. Uh, the property to buy the two sites that I, that I mentioned, the, uh, the Bollinger site is what we're looking at, roughly 19 acres. Is four hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. <throat> That's the price we can quote four seventy-five. It was nineteen eighteen point nine acres. Site number two that we're looking at, the forty-acre foot piece, is one point two million dollars at, at market value today. So um, the four hundred seventy-five thousand dollars I've been told is a pretty good buy for nineteen acres. Uh, and so that. This is a hard, fast offer right here. Um, we're just waiting for the bond. If we get that, this would be a, a purchase for us. And site number two, it may be down the road before we have to build another elementary or mm -hmm. middle school. It may be maybe five years, maybe eight years, seven years, but we will have that property because they're not making any more land. They're not building it. They're not building land or anything like that. You just, once it's there and you have an opportunity, that's the issue. It's basically, the district, school district, especially, especially for growing districts, you need to have an opportunity to purchase that land. Offsite development costs, and road and sidewalks, and things like that. Again, fifteen. You know, this is cut this in half. And here it is. For site two, is one million five hundred fifty. For site one, to replace that clock, one million five hundred fifty thousand dollars. So you cut this in half because we're only going to. Roughly half, because we're only going to issue 28 million, about 48 million. 20 we're going to hold in reserve, and we can hold that there for times. We don't have to issue that. But once you issue the bond, you have to use it within three years. Or else the, Fed, or else the feds or the IRS comes knocking at your door. And that could mean higher taxes for your uh, constituents, your stakeholders, and we don't want that. So, <clears throat> And this is what we're going to invest in Saddle Peak and Net Quad. To get that, those projects done that I talked about. And the future elementary number four, same price as that. Inflation costs, by the way, are built into the bond. 
not by us, but by the architects and builders. It, it, it's already built into the law. <clears throat> tax impact. This is this shows the tax impact if we were doing all 48 million dollars per year. This is what it would be for all 48 million. We're going to skip over these, this slide and go to the next one. The next, this is. Um, some of these bonds are coming off, and I apologize that I only have the high school bond debt service up amortization schedule here, but every year we have bonds out there that they're being paid off. They're all being paid off. Now, um, the Ridgeview part of one of the bonds is up, will come off in July of this year. It will come off at the end of July, July of 2019, it's 675000 will be coming off the taxpayer rolls. Uh, so there, there are bonds coming off. In 2025 um, will be the first year that a bond will come off the taxpayer rolls completely. And I'll let Jay talk about that a little bit here. Um, but the, the, next, uh, the next slide for... Yeah. Go on, we'll, we'll come back to this. This, I'll have him talk about. Uh, this is actually what we're going to do. It gives you the three scenarios. So. So when we talk about bonds, we're talking about um, when we issue the bonds, the money is going to go into a, um, a building fund and we'll use the money from the proceeds from the bonds um, to build the building. But when we're talking about tax impact, it's the debt service. And these bonds will be, two, uh, they're 20 year bonds. And if we didn't do anything from here down, and um, this is what our current year looks like. For a $100,000 house, um, the debt service in the elementary and the high school, because we're still paying for the high school bonds, um, comes to $152 a, a year. This is annual cost. If we were to issue, if, if it passes and we issue the $28 million right off the bat, um, from here, right here, this line right here is what is already on the books. That's what we're going to do next year. Um, so this doesn't go away in either case if we issued all $48 million or just the $28 million. The $139 will be on the tax rolls regardless. Um, what you can see is a reduction in uh, the elementary district. And some of the elementary districts is a million nine, some change, that are um, debt services coming off. And then that 675000 is built in there. And uh, that's gone forever. So it does go down a little bit. So the net effect, if we issue $28 million in July of 19, the total goes up to 203. So the net effect for a $100,000 um, property tax value, um, your taxes will go up $51. Uh, now, if you had a $200,000 home, that would double. That number would double also. 139. So if we issue the 48 million, the net effect is 97.06 for next year. We don't project out further than that because we don't know how the market's going to be when we go out to issue bonds. <coughs> so DA Davidson will they'll calculate in and then when they sell them, you, you know, it's a, it's a way to um, attract buyers. To, and we like to sell them all in one lot, and it's, then we get the money right off the bat. We don't have to have anything out there waiting to be issued. But um, as the years go by, uh, we can only use current market value, and then they'll build it in. And so this, this number, eventually, the thing that we're not talking about is that we're anticipating growth, right? This is if nothing changes, but as growth happens, that, that tax burden gets spread out across the, the district, and there is a potential that um, for a $100,000 house in future years, that number goes down. And the thing that, um, when, you, when you look at that, and that is all on the assessed value of their home, not market value. <coughs> That's a big difference, assessed value, not market value. And you may be able to sell your house for $300,000, but the assessed value of your home might not be two hundred thousand dollars, and you can go online and look at that. Um, when they did, uh, I think it was uh, Ridgeview. A lot of people thought their homes were worth three hundred and 
There were very few homes in Belgrade worth three hundred thousand dollars. Taxable value, uh, uh, mark, uh, assessed value, but market value, yes, but assessed value, no. So that the assessed value is going to be, um, it's going to be a lot more than what you have for your, your taxable value. Go back. Okay. Also, I need to, I need to tell you this is the first of, of a two-phase process, and there's 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 some confusion out there about between bonds and levies. Bonds build buildings. B is for building. B is for building. Levies are for lights and learning. Now, bonds will allow you to build the building and buy the lights initially to put in the building, but they won't allow you to turn the lights on. Levies allow you to turn the lights on. There's two distinct things there. Because you hear sometimes, uh, state owners, a voter will say, well, we gave you money then, now you're asking for it again. Why? There's a reason as to why. In this district, we, in the elementary district alone, um, we have not passed very many levies since 2008. I think there have been two, maybe, uh, and they've been abbreviated levies, meaning that not for the full amount, uh, for our capacity. Um, right now, we, in the elementary district, uh, last year, we were $292,000 in the red. And we've been using Medicaid funds to subsidize that, that deficit. Medicaid funds come in at $30,000 a quarter. We're spending it faster than it's coming in. At some point, that money's going to be gone. And we cannot think, this year we're projecting we're going to be $250,000 in the red in the elementary district. So that's where the levy portion comes in. In May, we have to run a levy as well. And then you look at the general public, and is that, I, I, I take responsibility, we take responsibility for that. We have not done a good enough job of explaining to folks why we need this money. Because people want to know. I don't think it's the general public's fault. If it fails, if this fails, it's not because Belgrade doesn't care about education, because you do. It's because we didn't do our job in convincing you this is why we need it. And that's why we need your help. Help us do a better job at convincing you. And so it's so this is not this is not a blame to taxpayers. We have we have to set responsibility for this baby right here. This is ours. And we're doing the best we can to, to, to correct that. So that we don't we don't we don't fall into that again. So we will have to do this again in May with the living. Regardless of what happens here, we have to run the levy in May. And, and, and one of the part of that levy will be for technologies. In this, in our district, we have over 800 computers, <coughs> over 800 computers that are nine plus years old. Many of the computers that we get come from two places: the state office of public construction, when they update and they upgrade, and they don't no longer need them, they give us what what they have, and we get them from the prison system. When they update, or when they upgrade, we get some of their computers. Um, we have um, some of our new phone system that we just got, um, courtesy of one of the banks in this, in this community that helped us with the phone system. They were upgraded, so they, we got their phones. We do our best to trim taxpayer dollars to save them and to spend them you know, in, a, in a wise manner. We're not out there just being thrift, just doing this kind of thing. <laughs> so, let's not. Um, Bianchi, yes. Can you address how much below the state average we are in spending in Belgrade? We are $1.2 million below the state average for elementary districts in spending, not rating funds, for, the, for the, uh, the state average in Montana. And that's not our data, that's the state's data. We are 1.2. We spend 1.2 million dollars below districts our size. will spend like elementary, middle school, uh, 41 and 48 dollars per student. Or we spend 48 and 41 dollars respectively. Those districts will one spend 110 and 120. 110 and 120 dollars. We're spending 48 and 41 dollars per kid. Respectively. That's what we do, and that's. Um, 
what happens is this. The cost of running schools continue to rise like this, and our revenue source is like this. And you can't continue to do that and have an effective school district. Um, and, I, I, and it's not a scare tactic, it's just a reality. And as most of you know, when you balance your own checkbooks at home, you can't balance that checkbook if you've got to cut your expenditures, you've got to put spending for the money you don't have, or you got to find a, another revenue source, you got to get another job. So, and that's, that's where we're at. If we, if we don't increase our revenue source, we're going to have to start cutting. And quite honestly, um, like I said, I just got here. I'm from another district, same size as Bell Ray, same number of students. And it amazes me, the longer I'm here, how much this district achieves with the amount of money that it has. In other words, your folks are, are squeezing those Lincolns pretty dang tight. You can hear Lincoln scream. It's, it's, um, it's amazing what they do. I mean, they're very efficient with the money, but um, at the same time, at some point, districts usually generally operate about 80 to 85 percent of their budget is personnel. It's people, right? We're a people business. That's the levies part. So you build a new school building, you gotta, you gotta man it. Otherwise, you just got four walls and nothing inside. But right now, our elementaries are running. 91% is personnel. We've cut everywhere we can cut. We're down to operating our elementary schools on 90% of the elementary budget. That's four schools. I just said that's, that's three right. elementaries and one middle school. Because yeah. they're all the same. So that can gives you an idea of what we're able to spend on. And then there's hard costs in there, like lights, electricity, um, you know, water, all those kinds of things. And that, that gives you an idea of how much you can actually spend on materials. So um, that's where we're getting at. And I've, I've, never, I've never had the experience of being that high in personnel. Usually it's about 82 to 83, which is about where our high school is. But the elementaries are definitely feeling the pinch. And you have, but we have a giving community. It's, a, it's an extremely giving community. We, we, we need uh, to fund resource officers. We had uh, someone in the community step up to the plate that we will donate $100,000 for resource officers over the next two years. Our high school needed marching band uniforms. Someone stepped up to the plate and said we will buy those marching band uniforms. It was $83,000 that cost of those 82, the cost of those band uniforms, and they said well, just round up to an even $90,000. So it's, it's a caring community. It's a giving community. But uh, that only goes so far. Cockpit? Yes. Um, in our planning, where are we going to meet capacity at the current middle school? And then on the long range planning of what we're anticipating for growth, when are we going to meet capacity at the high school? High school will be at two, uh, will be actually 1,300 kids who are 10 years out after it reaches 30. So it can handle 1,300 students. So the next 10 years, high school is set for good. And there's a five to 10 year capacity with the middle school as well. It has a 10 year span at 1,300 students. High school's currently at 960. The problem that you have with, that you have, the more students you get is not, you have a lot of kids, that's an issue. But then you also have to, you need increased support in that building of personnel to handle that part of it. I taught in the middle school for a couple of three years where we had 1,204 students. And it was it, it was it was it was tough. It was difficult, but we also had the extra support that we needed, the support staff that we needed to get that job done. It's a great question. You want to tell them the current tech levy, sixty-two thousand. Our current tech levy. This is for technology. It's kind of crazy. Sixty-two grand is what we have. Sixty-two thousand dollars for technology in the district. Per district. Yeah, high school in there too. Is the tech high school? A tech elementary. So we have $124,000 for technology. That's what we get to spend on a district this size. It's um, every Chromebook is good for three to five years. It's good for three to five years. So and then it becomes outdated. And some of them won't handle the software as software uh, changes and is upgraded. 
we have computers that won't handle that software. The balance of the expenditures flows right into the general fund. So what we can't spend out of the tech levy puts another burden on, on the general fund, fund, which shortens that 9%. So this is where we are on the call of the 18.9 acres. Currently in this property, the city is planning to annex this property. It's not there yet. There's a lift station uh, that should be completed by the end of February right here. Uh, that's going in. There's a subdivision of this side that's going in. Now, we also have, we have uh, in, in, the, uh, in the agreement, once we, whatever we put in there for cost, we will recuperate some of our costs for this process once that subdivision goes in so that we're not footing everything. We will remain most of it initially, but we will get some of that cost back to the district. That's only fair that we ask for that. Again, the 40 acres we're looking at um, south of the freeway for the future because of the growth on that side. We want something on the south side. The first the first set of people is going to be on the south side, to be honest with you. But we're working with two individuals we're working with for property on the south side. There's their 40 acre pieces. Is that call replacement site? This is just a schematic um, diagram of that site. Now, if you look down here, this part right here, that little hill, uh, plenty hill, that's a drain field. That's on part of their property, it's a drain field. But there's a lift station going in, and once the city hooks up to that, once it's, once it's in and fully uh, operational, then that subdivision will be able to hook up to that, uh, that, that, that system, the city system, once they annex it. And that drain field, we can reclaim that drain field and we can build on it. Right now, all you can use it for are fields, like soccer fields, uh, recreation, health enhancement, PE, and all that. It can still be used, but you just can't punch holes in it right now. So I want to be open and honest about that. This is a, a, 3D, a 3D view of the Hecqua site. We don't have any plans. Our plan is to use an existing an existing format uh, plan for a building that we already have. And people have talked about Ridgeview, and that will save us a few thousand dollars there for having an architect design it. We already have a design. How can we improve on this design to make it better to fit this site? You know, like Matt said, he would move this uh, cafeteria and gymnasium. So those kinds of that kind of input we will be looking at. But the design is already there. Why well, think of something different when you have it? Save yourself a lot of money. Next one. And this is elementary number four um, at middle school site number two concept. This is the elementary side. Again, this is not definite. I don't say well. Someone might say well. You showed us a diagram. And the elementary was over here, the middle school was over there, and now it's flip flop. But that's it's just a concept. Uh, and I know it seems kind of funny, but I was in a meeting and um, uh, a gentleman says, Well, you told me my tax dollars were going to go up this amount, but you were wrong. They went up two cents more than what you stated. <laughs> Literally, two cents more. It was a, and he was accurate. He was absolutely accurate, true. But, well, you know, we, we did our best. Next. And this is another uh, 3D view of, it in, of the future. This will be south of the freeway. And that's it. Any questions? 